Hello, I'm Dr. John Wright. I'd like to spend a little time with you explaining laser vision correction surgery. Many of you know that I have been in practice since 1982 and I have been involved with laser vision correction since 1991 and in fact I was part of the original FDA study. Sometimes patients ask me if I've ever had LASIK performed on my own eyes, but I'm one of the lucky patients who was born with 20-20 vision. However, family and staff have had the procedure and uh, almost everybody in our office has had this done. So how do we use the laser to correct eyesight? For nearsighted people, we're trying to flatten the curvature of the cornea. The cornea is this clear window on the front of the eye. For farsighted patients, we're trying to steepen the curvature on the cornea. And for patients with astigmatism, we're trying to make the cornea round. If I use this little ball to represent an eye with astigmatism, you can see that it has two separate curvatures. And what we do with the laser is to put a new contour on that cornea to make the cornea then round. We normally will use the LASIK approach when we do this, and with LASIK, we are creating a thin flap on the front surface of the cornea. The cornea is this clear window on the eye. We have a special laser that creates a thin flap about 20% depth of the cornea, and I'm representing that flap by this little thin piece of plastic. We then take the flap and we fold it back out of the way, and then we reshape the next layer down with the laser. We recontour this area here. When we're finished, we reposition the flap back over the cornea again. And the main reason we do this is for pain control. The flap has covered up the area that was lasered, so it's hiding all those pain fibers underneath the flap. And since we haven't disturbed the front surface of the cornea, most people, when they wake up the next morning, are able to see well enough to drive themselves into the office. However, not everybody can have LASIK. In some patients, the cornea may be too thin for us to create a flap on it because we do have to respect the thickness of the cornea and avoid thinning the cornea too much. And in some patients, they may have an abnormal topography pattern. During your pre-op exam, you'll have a topography picture made of your eyes. If we detect any abnormal patterns on your topography that would not make it safe to do the LASIK approach, sometimes we can use the PRK approach instead so that we're making the treatment very shallow on the surface of the eye. In this case, we would use the same laser, same software, everything's identical, but instead of doing the surgery underneath a flap, we'll actually do your laser treatment right on the front surface of the eye. We call this technique PRK, which is an abbreviation for photorefractive keratectomy. This is a technique that has been used by the Air Force on their pilots for many years, so you know that it gives a good vision result. The main difference between LASIK and PRK is that the PRK has more post-operative pain because we've created about an eight millimeter abrasion on the front surface of the cornea. It takes about four days to heal from PRK. We have to give you stronger painkillers on the level of Demerol, and we have to give you some anesthetic drops to help you through those four days. You would not see well enough initially to drive a car, to work, or even to use your computer. So it's important that if you have the PRK approach, that you pick a time where you can be out of commission for about four days. Your vision will start to come back usually on about day five, but it will take several weeks for your vision to catch up to where you would have been if we had performed the LASIK technique. The laser has a fairly wide range of application. We can correct low levels of nearsightedness ranging from half a diopter up to around 12 and for farsightedness from also about a half of a diopter up to about six. Now, if you're outside the range of the laser, we may recommend the implantable contact lens or possibly even a lens implant. 
Any patient who's age 42 or above will need reading glasses following LASIK due to the natural aging changes inside the eye. As part of the normal aging process, the lens continues to get larger from the time you're born until you die. And as it gets larger, it also gets bulkier and less flexible. About age 42, people first start to notice that they are no longer able to see fine print as well as they used to. So anybody who's having the laser performed that's age 42 or above is likely to need reading glasses following the treatment. LASIK won't accelerate the normal aging changes in the eye, so it should be similar to what you're experiencing right now with contacts or glasses. The only way around this problem right now is through monovision. With monovision, we actually set one eye for distance and the other eye for reading. Not everybody likes having the two eyes separated like that, so we try to simulate it with contact lenses first so you can kind of tr test drive it before we do anything permanent. Not everybody likes monovision. It's fairly black and white. When we do this demonstration for you, you'll either like it or you probably won't like it. I would say about a third of the patients choose monovision and probably two thirds of the patients prefer to have both eyes set for distance and then use reading glasses for their close work. There are certain contraindications to having LASIK. One in particular is called keratoconus. Keratoconus is a condition where the cornea is actually cone-shaped and it's actually thin and abnormally weak, so any type of laser treatment on a patient with keratoconus should not be done. That could be detected at the time of your pre-op exam when we do the topography pictures. Other contraindications would be if you've ever had herpes simplex on the cornea, and that has a very specific pattern. That means you went to an eye doctor, they looked at your cornea and diagnosed it. You should not have this done because this is an ultraviolet wavelength that could reactivate the virus and cause scarring. Pregnancy is a relative contraindication. We don't know for sure if the hormones of pregnancy could affect the way that your cornea heals. So it's better to just wait until all the hormones are back to normal. If a person has unrealistic expectations, they should probably stay away from LASIK. An example would be a 50-year-old person who demands that their vision be perfect for distance and reading both without reading glasses. That's not a realistic expectation. During the detailed exam, we will be measuring about 20 different parameters. We would like you to leave your contact lenses out prior to that detailed exam. If you're wearing soft contact lenses, I'd like you to leave your contacts out for about a week if they're daily wears. If you wear them extended wear, they should be out for about two weeks. If you're wearing gas permeable hard contact lenses, those should be out for about four weeks or until stable. It could take six weeks or even a couple of months. On the day of surgery, plan on being in our facility for about two or three hours. Please bring a driver because we'll have given you some Valium to get you relaxed before you have this procedure done. You'll be in the laser suite for about 15 minutes, even though the treatments are very brief, taking only about 20 seconds to create the flap, and most of the laser treatments take about 60 seconds, uh, that whole process takes about 15 minutes. Oftentimes patients ask me how they're going to keep their eye open during the treatment, and we have a little lid holding device that we use to kind of prop the lids open. It's not painful. Also, patients ask me how they'll know where to look in the right spot, and we have a little blinking light up in the laser that will have you watch to keep your eyes centered properly. Remember that the laser does have an eye tracker, so it will follow small movements during the treatment. Patients ask me, is there any pain with this procedure? And the answer is no, with the exception when the flap is being created, you'll feel kind of an intense pressure sensation around the white part of your eye. We use a little suction ring that suctions onto the white part of the eye and it totally immobilizes your eye while the laser is scanning that flap for about 20 seconds. So you'll feel kind of an uncomfortable pressure feel, feeling that lasts about 60 seconds and actually your vision goes dark during that step. And that, other than that, the entire process is comfortable. 
Most people have both eyes treated at the same time just for convenience, but it really makes no difference to me. If you prefer to see how your first eye turns out before you do anything with the second eye, that's perfectly fine. With LASIK, there's little or no pain following the procedure. However, as I mentioned earlier, with PRK, it is uncomfortable and we will use Demerol painkillers along with anesthetic drops to help keep you comfortable. With PRK, the anesthetic drops wear off in about 30 minutes, so it's impossible to get a good night's rest if you're putting drops in every 30 minutes. The idea there is to take the painkillers, get the pain under control, and if you wake up with the pain pills having worn off, that's the time to put in the anesthetic drops. The drops will give you 100% pain relief. For those patients who've had LASIK, on the day of your surgery, I would like you to keep both eyes closed the entire day. Avoid rubbing your eyes. You'll have some shields over your eyes. Please keep the shields on. With PRK patients, it won't really matter since there's no flap to become dislodged. As far as showering after the procedure, let's say on after post-op day one and beyond, it's okay to shower. We've never had any problems with infections. Just keep your eyes closed. I'd like you to avoid contact sports, basketball, football, anything that might cause trauma to your eye. But we have had patients go skiing or bicycling. If you just wear eye protection, I think it's okay to do that. Avoid swimming for about a month. I'd like you to stay out of hot tubs for about a month just because of the risk of infection. Swimmers could probably go back to swimming with goggles after a couple of weeks if you can just keep the contaminated water out of your eye. Patients who've had PRK, there's no restrictions after the surface has repaired and typically that takes four or five days. There are no problems with altitudes such as flying in an airplane and there are no pressure related problems such as you might have with scuba diving. Postoperatively, we would like both LASIK and PRK patients to be using their antibiotic and steroid drops. LASIK patients will use their drops for about a week and then discontinue. PRK patients will be using their antibiotic drops for about a week and then discontinuing. We will be on a tapering schedule of steroid drops that will be gradually tapered over the period of about a month. One other problem that patients can experience postoperatively is a double vision problem if only one eye has been treated. This is one reason why many patients treat both eyes at the same time. If you have one eye that's been corrected and the other one is still quite nearsighted or farsighted and you tried to wear glasses, you would actually get kind of a double vision effect. You could wear a contact lens in the opposite eye. There are potential complications with these procedures ranging from uh, mild problems such as irritation or light sensitivity, but there are also serious complications such as infection. Most of the complications we run into with LASIK have to do with the flap. If uh, patients are using their eyes a lot the first evening after surgery, sometimes it's possible for the flap to slip out of position or sometimes the flap can become wrinkled and the patient will come in the next morning with a displaced flap. Then we'll have to smooth that flap back into position again to correct that problem. Another problem that can happen is epithelial cells, these surface cells that normally are on the front of the cornea, sometimes can get underneath the flap and start to grow in this area here. This seems to occur a lot more commonly on enhancements rather than on primary surgeries. If we just see a few little epithelial cells out around the edge of the flap, oftentimes we can just observe that. But anything that's growing in toward the line of sight, we'll have to once again take the flap, fold it back, clean these cells out, and then reposition the flap back into normal position again. And lastly, it is possible to get an inflammatory reaction underneath the flap called DLK, diffuse lamellar keratitis. And this is normally treated with steroid drops. Uh, usually we have to treat the eye for a week or two to get that inflammation to quiet down. 
This is thought to be due to a reaction to bacterial toxins that can become baked onto the autoclave, the sterilizer. Sometimes these toxins can get on the instrumentation we use during surgery and create this inflammatory reaction. It doesn't happen very often, maybe one per 500 patients. Another potential complication that a person can encounter with either LASIK or PRK is called ectasia. Ectasia occurs if the cornea has been thinned to the point where the cornea has been weakened. When that happens, the corneal curvature itself will start to bow out like a weak spot on an inner tube. This is a very difficult problem to correct. The only way to see again clearly would be with a hard contact lens. The worst complication I can think of, other than death of course, would be uh, blindness. And so far we've never had a case of blindness. The more common problems that we do run in from time to time would be when we didn't get the curvature on the eye exactly where we'd like it to be. Since people are not made out of plastic, it stands to reason that we will get different responses from different patients' tissue. So we may get more of a response from one patient, so perhaps the corneal curvature is too flat, or perhaps it's too steep, or we didn't get the astigmatism perfectly corrected, so it's not perfectly round. So there's about a 10% chance you might require enhancement work. If you need enhancement work, we typically do that after about three months of stabilization. If you have very large pupils under dark lighting conditions, there's some chance that you would see halos around bright light objects at night. Uh, we can't laser your entire cornea. That would thin the cornea too much. So we laser the central area that you actually look through. And if you could envision for just a moment, let's say we used a treatment zone that's about this size, but your pupil actually dilates out this wide, there is some chance you would see reflections off the edge of that treatment zone that you would perceive as a halo or a ring around lights. You can still see through the halos and the rings, but it's just something that could be there. And we just like our patients to be aware of every possibility if it's more likely in your particular case. One of the most difficult complications that we do not see very often, maybe one in 500, is called irregular astigmatism where despite best technology and best medical efforts, the surface of the cornea can heal in kind of a ripply-like pattern. I've taken a piece of paper and crumpled it to use as an illustration. So you can see how complex a pattern that is, and it's very difficult to smooth that in a very precise fashion. I think that technology is coming where we'll be able to correct these complex patterns in the future, but if that were to happen, your vision would probably be best correctable to maybe the 20, 30, 20, 40 level, and you would, you would not be able to get clear vision with spectacles again. You would probably have to wear a hard contact lens in order to restore 20, 20 vision. So technologies coming perhaps in a few years will be able to correct this problem. Infections are another serious problem. Fortunately, we've only had one infection in the past 33,000 cases, so it's very very rare complication, but if you use your drops, that should help decrease the likelihood of that happening. If you should require an enhancement, I'll be happy to do this for you as long as you would like to have it done and it's medically safe. Once in a while, if there's not enough corneal thickness to work with, we can't go any further for safety reasons. When we do enhancements, we don't have to recut the flap. That's the riskiest part of the entire surgery, so we just take the existing flap and peel it back and do our reshaping and then put the flap back like we did on the initial procedure. PRK patients do have to go through PRK a second time. I wish I could give our patients a guarantee of 2020, but I think no surgeon has the ability to look into the future in advance and know exactly where their patient's going to turn out, but we do everything that we can to try to make that happen. Our results over the years have shown that 95% of our patients achieve 20-25 vision or better, and we have about a 10% enhancement rate.
In conclusion, please feel free to ask our staff if you have any further questions that weren't covered on this tape. We're here to provide the best surgical results and the most pleasant experience that we can. Thank you for trusting us with your eyes.